Hello everyone, my name is Bridget Ebert and I kindly welcome you to my channel in this video. I am a teacher's assistant for a college class titled History of Fashion Design, where I have the profound opportunity from the professor to create videos during the semester on fashion and dress throughout history. This week's topic is learning about Native North American dresses in the late 19th and early 20th century. The source I used for today's topic is Identity by Design, Tradition, Change, and Celebration in Native Women's Dresses, published in 2007. This was edited by anthropologist and curator Emile Hermeni Horses from the Lakota Nation. This is also in association with the Smithsonian Institution in DC, the National Museum of the American Indian. This book examines the stories and symbolism linked with Native American dress, the creativity and cosmopolitan cosmopolitanism of women's enduring traditions and how dresses were expressions of cultural identity. This book reflects on how dress styles reflect cultural continuity and adaption in the face of colonialism. Dresses serve as powerful symbols of resilience, cultural pride, and celebration among Native women. I wanted to pull some quotes from the book Collaborators. Uh, first, we have W. Richard West Jr., a member of the Cheyenne and Arapaho Nations of Oklahoma and the founding director of NMAI. He states, clearly dresses are more than simple articles of clothing for Native women. They are complex expressions of culture and identity, often made from such organic materials as deer hide and elk teeth and infused with the spirit of the maker, a dress can seem to take on a life of its own. This is from page 11. And I also included Emil Hermeni Horses, a Lakota artist and NMAI curator. He states, clothing is seen as a vessel that holds the human spirit. Dresses are more than garments. They are evidence of a proud and unbroken tradition. Also from page 11. In accordance with this book, there was a 2005 exhibition. Uh, so in December of 2005, the National Museum of the American Indian invited six Native Indigenous women artists from the Plains, Plateau, and Great Basin to review the museum's dress collection and discuss Indigenous clothing. These six Native women are contributors to both the exhibition and the sourced book. Left to right, we have Jamie Akuma, Luciano, Shoshone Bannock, Gladys Jefferson, Crow, Joyce Growing Thunder Fogarty, Assiniboine Sioux, Jackie Parsons Blackfeet, Carrie Jane Myers Comanche, and Juanita Growing Thunder Fogarty, Assiniboine and Sioux. The first garment we will look at is the sidefold dress. The sidefold dress was created by wrapping a large animal skin around the body and sewing a seam up one side. This dress was most popular in the early 1800s and worn by Native women of the Upper Missouri River, Nation, River Region and the Northeastern Plains and the Western Great Lakes Region. The cut of sidefold would make it prohibitive for a woman to ride astride a horse. And the image here on the right is a Sioux sidefold dress from 1830 South Dakota. The dress is made of hide, pony beads, porcupine quills, tin cones, and cloth. And alongside, I also included a diagram that visually shows the garment. Next, I really wanted to go over beads. Um, I do have a close-up image of a Kiowa cloth dress from 1900 uh, showing beading very up close. Uh, so prior to European contact, Native people made beads from shell, bone, stone, and other natural materials. After European contact, most of the beads traded to tribes by French, English, Russian, and Spanish traders were made in Italy. And the, Eurist, the earliest European and trade beads, which arrived in the Western Great Lakes region about 1675, would eventually reach the plains by the 1800s, were the large pony beads. Around 1850, a smaller bead, referred to as a seed bead, was introduced. This marked the start to a new period in beadwork, as the smaller size beads enabled dressmakers to do elaborate work that covered more of the dress. Next, we have the two high dress and the two high dress um, was 
very popular and in fashion in the early 1830s. It was made by matching two sides of deer, elk, or bighorn sheep. The full skirted two skin dress was the ideal solution to the new way of travel on horseback. The tail of the animal was left intact on each side and along with a section of the hind legs of the hides would be folded over forming a yoke or cape at the shoulders of the dress. The tail was the central design in the front and the back of the dress, as you can see in this image here. Um, early examples of this style, such as the Arikara dress on the right, were decorated with earth paints. And according to historian Richard Kahn, the style of dress can be found among the Blackfeet, Crow, Dakota, and other plains and plateau nations. So here I have the Arikara two high dress from 1840 North Dakota. Uh, made of bighorn sheep hide and blue, green, and red paint. And above, uh, next to the image and above my uh, citation, I have the diagram showing the two high dress. Here are more images of two high dresses. We have the Yakama two high dress from 1890 in Washington on the far left, made of hide, pody beads, and seed beads. Uh, next to that in the middle, we have a Shoshone two hide pattern dress with a fully beaded yoke in 1880, uh, which was from Colorado, and it's hide, seed beads, and red wool. And then we have Jamie Akuma, who's Luciano, and Shoshone Bannock wearing her own dress in 2005. I pulled a quote from page 31 that says extensive beadwork such as these dresses is found on many plateau dresses today. The animal's tails have been replaced by beadwork. Now introducing the three hide dress. Uh, the classic three hide dress is made with one hide forming the poncho like cape and one hide for the front and one for the back of the skirt. The legs of the hide are left intact on the dress. And if you look over to the right where my mouse is, you will see a diagram showing um, the three high dress. You have one hide here for the poncho like cape and then one for the front and one for the back. Uh, Carrie Jane Myers, a Comanche dressmaker and champion Southern buckskin style dance competitor says that the hides are left in their natural shape. She states, we try to use everything in its natural form. When you folded a deer skin over to make the top for a three hide dress, two legs would hang on each side of the dress. And that's from page 54 of the book. And in the Southern Plains, the three hide dress consists of a cape attached to a skirt made from two hides. Historically, this style mimicked a poncho and skirt combination worn by women living as far south as Mexico. And that's from page 55. We also have um, an image here from a Kiowa three hide dress from 1880 uh, made of black tailed deer hide, brass spots, and seed beads. And I have some close up images as well. To follow, we have the elk tooth dress. Uh, a quote I pulled from page 37 states, a large number of elk teeth on a dress indicated that the wearer's spouse was a skilled hunter or had the means to trade for the teeth. Elk teeth represented long longevity because when other parts of the elk decayed, the ivory teeth remained. Another quote I pulled from page 41 is, the number of elk teeth is a sign of the wealth of the girl's family. Since only the eye teeth of the elk, two per elk, are used on dresses, relatives may have been excellent hunters or traders. Uh, to the right, I have a couple images here. The first image up top is a crow elk tooth dress uh, from 1900 in Montana. A hide imitation elk teeth, which is bone, seed beads, and red wool. And below that, I have an image um, in quotes I pulled from the book. It says, women parading in their elk tooth dresses at Crow Fair in Montana. And this was taken in 1996. Here are more images of the elk tooth dress. On the far left, we have a crow elk tooth dress from 1890 in Montana. Uh, next to that, we have a Sioux girls two high dress from 1850 in South Dakota. In the middle, we have a crow elk tooth dress uh, from 1910 in Montana. We have OOB Kiowa wearing a three high dress decorated with 150 elk teeth. Uh, the photo was taken in 1895. And then on the far right, we have one of the book contributors, Gladys Jefferson, who is from the Crow Nation and her elk tooth dress in 2005. 
Next, we have the cloth dress. Um, cloth was often distributed by the U.S. government as part of treaty allotments. The Arapaho artist who made this everyday dress pictured right, uh, right where my mouse is circling, may have received the cloth that way. This dress would have been worn with the belt and shawl, and in the colder months, the wearer would have would layer several of these dresses over one another for warmth. And that was from page 75. And another quote I pulled from page 117 is, as cloth became more plentiful and hides more scarce, women made loose, semi-tailored dresses. The ones of wool provided warmth, and the yokes of the finest could easily be ornamented with local items, such as elk teeth or dentalium shells from the Pacific. Over on the all right, we have a Mandan cloth dress from 1880, North Dakota. Here are some more images of cloth dress. So we have a Sioux cloth dress from 1900, uh, South Dakota. Materials making up this dress are blue wool, uh, dentalium shells, German silver brooch pins, ribbon, brass sequins, and thread. And then we also on the right have a Blackfoot cloth dress from 1910 in Canada. Finally, I have this last image of cloth dress. Um, these range from the late 19th to early 20th century. Uh, on the far left, we have a Sioux cloth dress from 1900. In the middle, we have a Lakota cloth dress from 1890. And on the far right, we have a Sioux cloth dress from 1890. And I also included a close-up image. Um, these included red, green, and black paint um, on top of wool or muslin. And finally, I just wanted to have a thank you and an acknowledgement to the source. Um, I did pull this quote from Carrie Jane Myers from the Comanche Nation, and she states, when you wear your dress, you're carrying the spirit of all the people who gave you the lessons of life, who made dresses before you. Um, and I just wanted to conclude by saying identity by design, tradition, change and celebration in Native women's dresses published 2007 showcases the world renowned collection of Native American dresses held by the Smithsonian's NMAI. This book edited, edited by award winning beadwork artist and NMAI curator Emile Hermeni Horses Ogala Lakota presents a fascinating array of Native women's clothing from the Plains, Plateau, and Great Basin regions of the United States and Canada dating from the 1830s to the present and including dresses, shawls, belts, bags, and hair accessories. The words, insights, and memories of a number of contemporary Indigenous women artists who design and make dresses enrich the text of identity by design and add a fascinating new dimension to our understanding of this attire. This book accompanied a major exhibit at the Smithsonian's NMAI. So here I am concluding and I very much thank you for joining me in this video and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much. Goodbye.